Set switches over. I am not originally from the state of Florida. I'm originally from Minnesota, just a couple states north of here. I was born and raised in a Christian home at the age of six. My dad led me to the Lord after at our church's vacation Bible school. Made me pray in my own words. He didn't make me read something off of a tract to repeat after him. He wanted to make sure that my desire for salvation was genuine, that I prayed my own words. And I'm very thankful that my dad made me do that. As any little boy, I began to struggle with doubts for about four years. And in, 20, in November of 2010, we were having our family devotions. And the topic was on hell. And for some reason, it scared the living daylights out of me. I've been battling with doubts for those four years up to that point. I didn't know. I, I was sick of it at this point. And I went, I went into my bedroom that night. I could tell you the color of the bed sheets. I could show you where I knelt. I could even tell you the pajamas I was wearing. I knelt down that night, November 15th of 2010, and said, God, I'm sick and tired of wandering. And I received assurance of my salvation that night at the age of 10. And uh, when I was a child, what I intended to be, what I was endeavoring to be, what my childhood dream, if you will, was to be a commercial airline pilot. So I was invested in schooling for that. And the uh, just so happened that the summer uh, before I enrolled in a secondary high school program to receive my private pilot license to begin pursuing that career. I was attending a youth rally in 2017 in Manitoba, Canada, Brother Carlson's church, and I heard a message preached, let God set you on fire and let the world come watch you burn. And I received conviction that night to surrender my life to Christ. I went forward at the age of 17, surrendered all my dreams of the whole piloting, the whole commercial pilot. And I said, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I surrendered. I didn't know idea what facet of ministry that was going to be. I just knew that God wanted me to serve him with my life. And I surrendered my life to him at the age of 17. I knew my next step was obviously going to be receiving biblical training. Now, I had grown up vacationing to Central Florida and land and visiting the church because where else does a Minnesotan go when you're sick of negative 20? You vacation to Central Florida. That's just what you do. So I had grown up listening to our sending church's pastor, Brother James Knox. I had grown up listening to him. I visited the school one year. We were down there, and it became evident that is where I was supposed to go. Actually, five years ago today, July 16th, 2018, I packed up my little car and began to head south to Florida for Bible school. By God's grace, you can flip to the next slide, I graduated the program in May of 2022. And then you can go along to the next one as well. Along my four-year course of study, God saw fit to bring someone very special into my life. If you haven't guessed who that is, I can have her stand up again. But that was my wife, Kirsten. We began dating in 2019. I asked her to marry me in 2021. And we happily tied the knot just over a year ago in June of last year. So we're new to ministry. We're new to marriage. We're new to a lot of things. I'm just an all-around rookie. And that's exactly how I like it. But I didn't come to ramble about our life story. I came to ramble about where we're going. You can go ahead and go to the next one. The Navajo Nation, the Navajo tribe are the largest federally recognized tribe in the United States of America. They have surpassed the Cherokee. They are now in the government's eyes the largest according to their records. Along with having the largest tribe, they can also boast having the largest reservation. You can see the area it takes up 27,413 square miles. Now to put that number in perspective, it is a couple square miles larger than the state of West Virginia. So it is a very large and expansive piece of land and it's home to around 400,000 Navajo people. We go ahead and go to the next one, sister. Now how God laid the Navajos specifically on my heart in July of 2021, we took a mission trip there with the young adults from our church into land. And I had no intention of this turning into a missions call. I was just excited to be out of quarantine and on a mission trip again. Amen. I was sick and tired of being cooped up and I was ready to get out on another mission trip. I had grown up going on missions trips and I was excited to be on another one. We get there in Arizona. We're there to assist a missionary whose name is Joel Haynes, which you hear more about him in just a second. We were there to help him with his vacation Bible school in Pinon, Arizona. Arizona. Where's Pinyon, Arizona, you might ask? Look at the Arizona section of the reservation. Find nowhere. Point to the middle. And that's probably where Pinyon's going to be. It's right in the middle of nowhere. And we're there for our first Sunday. No intention of this being what God would call me to do. Brother Haynes motions to Kirsten and I. He goes, I need you to hop in my truck. You're on a bus route with my dad this week. And I need to show you which houses to stop at where the kids are coming from for vacation Bible school. So we hop in. We're driving through. And he asked me the question. He goes, so when do you graduate Bible school? And I said, well, Lord willing, I'll graduate in May of 2022. And he goes, well, what are you doing after that? And by this point, I didn't know. Like I said, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a commercial pilot. When I moved on to Bible school in 2018, I thought I was just going to go back to Minnesota and plant a church in my home state. But by the time that I had gone on this mission trip, that desire had all but faded. I didn't know what God wanted me to do. Little did I know God had me lined up for the punch. 
And I answered, I don't know. And Brother Haynes began to explain to me what had been taking place on the reservation over decades gone by, how now it was such a ripe field of harvest and churches were needed to be planted in cities all over the reservation because of multiple scenarios, church members having to move away for work, family members of church members wanting a church to come to them, or the tribal council in one city in particular asking Brother Haynes to come plant a church in their village. And I began to, I just brushed it off at first, but I had a shift in perspective, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. As we were driving back that afternoon, which by show of hands, how many of you in here ever been to the Southwest United States? Other than my wife. I know you've been there. <laughs> All right, so a decent chunk of you. Those of you who have been there, those of you who haven't, this picture can suffice. The scenery there is beautiful. It's a lot different than what we're used to here, what I used to when I'm growing up in, you know, the, the rolling hills and the lakes and the woods. It's a lot different, but there's so many scenes out in the Southwest that are just breathtaking. There's so many beautiful reminders of God's creation that exists out there that it's so easy to just get caught up in the natural beauty. And just notice the scenery. But I thank God for changing that perspective. We can go to go to the next one. And all that scenery, seeing all of that natural beauty just fell away. And I began to see a people. And I began to see a Navajo tribe trapped in fear. The Navajo reservation was used as a testing ground for COVID-19. Whatever you may believe about the conspiracies on that, well, that is what happened. And it's, it killed a lot of the elderly. It scared a lot of them that were left. Or even families, like depicted here, wearing masks, social distancing, because my medicine is not giving me any hope. If this virus gets me and I die, I don't know what happens next. I'm going to do whatever they're telling me to do. I'm going to put on masks. I'm going to distance from those I love because I am afraid. And if they weren't trapped in fear, you can go to the next one. If they weren't trapped in fear, then they were trapped in tradition. A religion of rigorous works and performing this ceremony, performing this dance, paying your medicine man this amount of money to appease this spirit and appease that spirit, and being religiously devoted to it. Thinking they're getting somewhere. But not realizing the religion that they're trapped in is condemning them further and further into hell. If they weren't trapped in fear, if they weren't trapped in tradition, the next slide will depict... Then they're trapped in addiction. Drugs and alcohol are a rampant problem on the reservation. I know it's a rampant problem pretty much everywhere, but it seems amplified amongst the Navajo people. Now, alcohol is illegal to sell on the reservation, so you might think that that would solve a lot of the problems. Well, no, it doesn't, because man still has a sin nature, and they'll do whatever they can to get their hands on it. They'll use whatever money they have to waste it on bootlegged alcohol. Now, I'm not speaking from experience here, so don't assume anything this morning. But if you were to buy a single can of beer bootlegged on the reservation, it's going to cost you around $12. Just one can. So they're already a very poverty-stricken people, so they waste whatever money they have on that. Well, if they don't have the money to buy that, well, then what do they do? How guns and ammo are locked up in grocery stores out here, stuff with alcohol is locked up out there. Because homeless men like this would walk in off the street, grab a bottle of hairspray, hand sanitizer, rubbing alcohol, mouthwash, you name it. If it has alcohol in it, they would walk in, grab a container, drink the whole bottle, throw the container on the ground and walk out. And you may say that's disgusting. That's how desperate they are to fill that void that's screaming in here. The only hole in their conscience that can be filled by Christ, they're doing everything they can to cover that up for one more day. Trying to, just trying to find something. And drugs are also a rampant problem. You see a burnt down meth house in almost every town. The church plant we'll be going to work with, there's a meth house behind there that has burnt down three times and that's been rebuilt. It's a rampant problem out there. And I began to see a people where, where the gospel had been proclaimed, where the ground had been plowed 40, 50, 60 years and missionaries come and gone on the reservation. I began to see a field that had begun to spring up into a harvest and a field that was ready and where churches were planted, souls were saved, lives were changed. And the reservation was no longer in a lack of labor, in a lack of fruit stage. But now the Navajo people were in such a great time of harvest that it was in a state of lack of laborers. And if you would go, go to the next slide, the next verse that began to ring out in my head is Matthew 9, 37 and 38. We all know these verses. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I began to pray that afternoon as God shifted my perspective that God would make it plain that the reservation is what he, where he would have me to serve him with the rest of my life. And I, I, I just I wanted to keep it between myself and God because I've had the mission trip jitters before. First few days you're there, you're ready to charge hell with a squirt gun. By the end of the week, you're like, where's my boarding pass? I want to go home. 
And I didn't want to spread it around. I wanted to make sure that this is what God wanted me to do. Fast forward to the next day. I climb out where the guys are staying. I climb out on one of the rocks outside the, the church playground. I'm overlooking the, the scenery where we were staying. And I prayed again that God would make it plain that this is what he'd have me to do. And I had, obviously, from my devotions previously, I put my bookmark in my Bible because we had to rush off real quick. And I, I, I had remembered where I was, but I didn't know exactly where I was reading the next day. I open up and my bookmark's resting at Isaiah chapter 6. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Now, I'm from Minnesota. I'm Norwegian. I'm very stubborn. You can ask my wife. I just wrote this off as coincidence. Well, fast forward. If you go to the next slide, fast forward to Tuesday evening. I'm preaching the closing assembly of the Vacation Bible School. I was given the responsibility of the gospel message at the end of the night. And I was preaching on, on how works can't save because the Navajo's religion is very works based. It's very, you have to pay this money, do this work, do this dance, and then you might do this. So the whole premise of my message was works cannot save. Now, I had no intention of yelling at them about any specific facet of their religion because I didn't want them to be like, who's this white guy who barges in on a reservation, barks at us for 20 minutes, and then leaves? I wanted to be gracious and compassionate in my presentation of the gospel. Well, as I was preaching that night, I said this sentence. I said, medicine men cannot save you. That's all I said. I didn't say anything else about their religion. I moved on with the night. Didn't, th didn't think anything of it. Well, the next night, Wednesday night, Brother Haynes, the missionary we're there to help, is talking to one Navajo man the entire time we're there. It's about a three-hour ordeal of crafts, games, etc. And I'm, I'm still trying to figure out names and faces, so I just assumed it was a church member. Well, the night closes out, and Brother Haynes comes up to me, and he goes, Brother, you've still got it. I don't care who you are or how well you know me. That's a weird way to start a conversation. But anyways, and I said, got what? And he goes, that was a medicine man who was here last night. Now, in Navajo culture, what a medicine man will do is they'll sit outside their hut or their hogan and they'll beat a drum. They don't have an open sign. That's how they show that they're open for business. Every 20 or 30 minutes, a native will show up, ask for a ceremony, he'll perform it, they'll pay for it. Cycle starts over, repeats itself multiple times throughout the day. Well, this man's talking to Brother Haynes. He goes, Pastor, I beat my drum for three hours today. Nobody showed up. He goes, I started beating it harder and louder and harder and louder. He goes, Pastor, I beat my drum so hard today, I beat a hole in it. And I couldn't get that message from last night out of my head. I knew I had to come back. No, I'm not saying, I am not up here to say, look, my preaching brought a medicine man back to vacation Bible school. That is not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, look how far God's willing to go to call another reaper to the field. And look at also the magnitude of the harvest that's taking place amongst these people. If you go ahead and go to the next slide, you may be wondering what happened to that medicine man. Well, I was just out there for a conference in October of last year. And one of the days I was there in the back door watched Roland Yellow Horse. A former medicine man who is a born-again Bible-believing Christian. That's the magnitude of the harvest that's taking place. The high priests, so-called of their religion, are turning to Christ. Now, the sins of the old life, the drugs, the alcohol, all those sins of the old life did catch up to this brother, and he did pass away just a couple months ago. But my hope is I'll see him in heaven one day, because he heard the gospel and accepted Christ. Because he was ready to be harvested, and he was one of the lucky ones where there was a laborer in his area. If you go ahead and go to the next slide, this, this next slide is the Joel Haynes family. This is the family we'll be going to assist. The best way I could describe Brother Haynes, to those of you who have never met him, is a walking coffee bean. He is an endless ball of energy, and um, all five of his boys have that same energy. Um, so he, his wife is a saint for dealing with all six of them. But Brother Haynes is a second generation missionary to the Navajo people. His dad was called to the native tribe, to the Navajo tribe, and still is a missionary there. They're about 30 minutes apart from where they live. But Brother Haynes, when he went back to the field in 2012, he saw that season shift. He grew up under that time when you knock on the same door four or five times before they come to the door just to cuss you out and get you off their property. He began to see that season shift for the God was beginning to take root and people were beginning to get saved. So when he went to the field in July of 2012, you can go to the next slide, he set a goal that he wanted to plant 10 churches in 15 years. Now any mission field, that's a pretty high stakes goal. Add Native American missions on top of that, what in the world, you may be thinking, what in the world was this guy thinking? But we serve a God that can accomplish the impossible. It's 11 years this July since the clock began to tick on this goal. And you can go ahead and hit the arrow one more time, sister. And there's nine new church plants on that reservation. That Brother Haynes has, had a, has a hand in planting in multiple different facets of 
uh, native men taking churches, native church planting missionaries taking churches, church planting missionaries like my wife and I going to work with them and then going out to plant a church. But churches are popping up all over the place. And this highlighted church down here, Stronghold Baptist Church in Pinyon, Arizona, that is where we took our missions trip to. But that is also where my wife and I will be ministering for the first few years of our ministry in Pinyon, Arizona. If you go ahead and flip through the next few slides. Um, a few of the members here, this is Brother Roger, him and his son Rigo, despite their family being trapped in native traditionalism and um, them still being stooped, have rejected all of that to serve Christ. This is Sister Angelica. If she walked in the back doors here today, you would, not, you would, you would be amazed that you've never met a more joyful soul that has the joy of the Lord that has overcome her life more than this woman. Well, her husband all but disowned her when she accepted Christ. And you would not be able to tell because how happy she is to be in church on a Sunday and on a Wednesday. The next slide is Brother, is brother Anderson. This brother used to sleep drunk behind the grocery store in Pinyon, trapped in addiction, seeking for any food or anything with alcohol that was getting thrown out in the trash to survive another day. He heard the gospel. He accepted Christ. This brother has not missed a church service in Pinyon in the entire time that church has been established. He is, an, he is an excellent brother. He is a sweet spirit. He can be a little intimidating. He's got that Native American intimidation about him. But he has a very sweet soul. He does everything he can to help that church. Because he wants to serve his Savior as hard as he was going for sin before. We can learn a lesson from that. Going as hard for Christ as we were for the old life. But I'm not preaching. That's for the main service. And the next slide is Brother Diedrich and his wife, Joetta. They are missionaries themselves. They have surrendered to go reach their own people. And they'll be going on deputation this October to go plant a church in another section of that reservation. Now you can go ahead and flip one more. If I could sum up in one slide the magnitude of the harvest, it would be this one right here. But there's no way to really sum up what's taking place out there in one picture, but I'll do justice. There's no way to do justice, but I can try. The Navajo Land Baptist Survival of 2022 happened to fall in the last three days of our survey trip when we were there. And uh, our sending church's pastor happened to be one of the speakers, so he got to see firsthand what is taking place amongst the Navajo people. Now you can see this meeting house is pretty packed out, right? Well, there's a breezeway on the left, pic on the left picture, and then there's a door on the right picture. You can see the door on the right is open, and there's a door on the left as well. That one's also open. Why, you might ask, because there's no air conditioning. Well, that would be a possible scenario. But no, there were crowds of Navajos standing outside the building. Wanting to listen to the singing and listen to the preaching. You don't find meeting houses packed out like that anymore. And yet here's a Native American tribe that's hungry for the gospel that's packing out a meeting house to hear some preaching and sing some songs. If you go ahead and flip to the next slide, our goals in the ministry... Obviously, first things first, you can click once again. We want to evangelize the lost. I know that sounds super cliche for a missionary. Well, yeah, duh, that's your primary goal. Yes, it is our primary goal. We're not trying to bring modern American conveniences to the Navajo people. We're not trying to bring the American dream to the, to the Navajo people. We're trying to bring the gospel to a lost and dying Native American tribe. That's our primary goal. You can go ahead and click through a couple of those, sister. It's a list. Our next one will be get acclimated to the culture. We want, to become, we want to follow the principle of the Apostle Paul and become all things to all men that I might save some. We want to become as much like them as we can to reach them as a way to earn their respect, as a way to show them that we care and ultimately to show them that Christ cares about their soul. We want to dress the way they dress, learn their language, which I'll touch on in just a second. But we want to walk up to them and they see that we're taking an interest in their culture. And that obviously we care about their culture and that we care about them and that ultimately that God cares about their soul. Thirdly, we want to minister at Stronghold Baptist Church in Pinyon, Arizona. There's so many positions and ministries that are ready to get up and going that Brother Haynes doesn't have the time or the manpower to do. And that'll simply be a plug and play situation for us. So there's so many of those that are simply awaiting our return to the reservation to get up and running. The next, the next one would be learn the language. Now we don't need to learn the language. All Navajos speak English. But if you were in here this morning and everyone in here was a Navajo, and I walked up to you and spoke to you in English, if you were cordial, you'd carry on a conversation, right? But if I walked up to you and spoke to you in your native language, a white person from off the reservation spoke to you in your native language, do you think you'd be a little bit more inclined to listen to what I have to say? That's why we want to learn the language. As a way to remove that barrier is another way to show them that we care. After all of this has been accomplished, the next goal is eventually in God's will and His timing to branch out on our own. 
and plant a church in Kayenta, Arizona. You can go ahead and click through twice. That'll take you to the next slide. Now, Kayenta, Arizona is one of the largest cities on the reservation. It and its surrounding area have a population around 5,500 people. It's also situated in a very high tourist traffic area, which I'll touch on in just a second. But the most staggering fact of all of it is 75 miles in any direction from Kayenta, Arizona, you will find zero Bible-believing Baptist churches. Now, what happened to those nine that Brother Haynes planted? This reservation is the size of West Virginia. You sprinkle nine churches into West Virginia, there's still going to be quite a few gaps to fill. And Kayenta is right in the center of one of those gaps. And the, the, the significant thing about Kayenta is it's one of the largest. It's got around 5,500 people surrounding its city. But it's also got a lot of tourist destinations around it as well. So not only with a church planted there could we reach the 5,500 natives, which is our primary goal, but we can have the opportunity to reach tourists from all over the world. You can see here, Kayenta is right up here. I'll step down here and point it out so you all can see it. Kayenta would be this dot right here. And just up here would be the Four Corners Monument. Just down here, this purple triangle would be Monument Valley. If you've ever seen a John Wayne Western movie, you've seen Monument Valley, I'm sure. And just over here is the Colorado River. So just off the map would be the Grand Canyon. And it's all connected by that one U.S. highway. Now, you can imagine, if you will, a tourist from New England or maybe central, you know, central, the, the central United States traveling through thinking, I cannot believe people still live like this. This looks like a third world country, which it is. If I dropped you in the middle of the reservation and told you you were in Arizona, a lot of you would laugh at me because it does not look like the United States. But imagine they stop at a stoplight in Kayenta and there's a Navajo standing there holding a sign that says Jesus saves. I don't know about you, but that gets me excited every time I think about it. That not only could we have an impact on the native people in an area of a harvest field that has not yet been reaped, but also they could have an impact on tourists from all over the world from a dusty res town in Arizona. You can go to the next slide, sister. How God laid Kayenta specifically on our hearts. We went there on our survey trip. This is the first lady I had interaction with in Kayenta. I walked up and gave her a track, told her who I was and where we were from. And her first question to me threw the alcohol on her breath was, where is your church? What am I going to tell her? Walk 75 miles down this highway, climb over these few mesas over there. Oh, that's just the alcohol talking. Alcohol has never asked where a church is. In all the time I've been on the street, I've never had someone who is drunk ask me where my church is. And I can't help but think, but that was that soul that's crying out for help, asking, and I couldn't give her an answer. Because there's no church there in Kayenta. The next slide, if you will, we went out a couple days later, just my wife and I, just to knock some doors, plow the ground. Every single Navajo where there was an evidence of someone home, not a single one of them turned us away. All of them took tracks. They were curious as to why we were there. Not like, why is a white man on my land? But why did you come from Florida to tell me this? What an open door. And you could go to the next slide. We walked up. There was a family out enjoying the Arizona sunshine sitting in the garage. Gave them all tracks, told them who we were once again. And this gentleman in the white t-shirt asked, they began to ask about other churches that were in the area, which I'll tell you what churches are in Kayenta. Mormons, JWs, Pentecostals, Catholics, the Native American church that mixed smoking peyote with reading the Bible and think they're worshiping God. Nothing but cults. And I began to answer them from the Bible. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, etc. They teach this, and the Bible says this, and we go with what the Bible says. We're Bible believers. And finally, this man speaks up again. And he goes, well, you're a preacher, and we're just sitting here. Why don't you preach to us right now? Amen. Now, I have been door knocking in multiple states and a couple of countries. That has never happened before. You can ask my wife. I stood there for a few seconds. Like, did he just say what I think he said? I took him to the track. I gave him the gospel. Asked if any of them would want to be saved. None of them wanted to be saved that day. You could go to the next slide. But that seed was planted. Who's going to water it? Who's going to water it? Oh, one of the other pastors. One of the, no, they're 75 miles isolated from the nearest church. And the harvest magnitude is the same in all, everywhere where the churches are. They're busy with their own areas. They are isolated off by themselves. There is that seed that is implanted, surrounded by nothing but thorns. And I pray every night that this family does not get choked out by those thorns. Will we have a chance to get back to them and follow up with that seed that was planted? You can go ahead and go to the next slide, sister. We're finishing up. One of the verses that got me called, Isaiah 6, 8, and 9. I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go. 
and tell this people you could click one more time. Now my wife and I are willing to go. We're ready to go. We're looking for people who are willing to help us get there. You can flip one more slide and then I'll be done. Acts 26, 18, the verse that could pretty much sum up our ministry. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan unto God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. And inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That is the opportunity we have. To bring the light of the gospel to a people trapped in darkness. To bring the light of the gospel to a people lost and dying within the confines of the United States of America. And a people that if you've read any history have not been treated very well by our government. But a people that are ripe, a people that are hungry, and a people that are searching for the gospel. And we have the opportunity to bring them that. And we're just looking for people who are willing to help us get there. We've been full-time deputation since October. God's seen fit to already raise our support to 70%. We're very excited about God accelerating us along that path. We're praying about going to the field in March of 2024. We ask that you join us in prayer if you're able to pick up a prayer card from me personally or from the table. You can also sign up on the back. There's a sign-up sheet if you'd like to put your email down to receive our prayer letters via email. Thank you once again, Brother Wilcox, for having us in. It's good to be back in this area, and uh, we look forward to the main service. Let's go ahead and close. I'll close my presentation with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I thank you for the attentive of the people here in Unionville, Missouri. Lord, I pray that this uh, presentation has touched the hearts of everyone here. Lord, I pray you just be with the main service now, and I pray you'd help us to honor you. May everything be glorifying to you, and uh, may, may you get glory, honor, and praise from everything in the hour to follow. In Jesus' name.